This program has been made possible in part by a grant from the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation and with an in-kind grant from Video Production Services, the Henry Kendall College of Arts and Sciences, the University of Tulsa. This program is sponsored by the National Conference. The National Conference of Christians and Jews, founded in 1927, is a human relations organization dedicated to fighting bias, bigotry, and racism in America. The National Conference promotes understanding and respect among all races, religions, and cultures through advocacy, conflict resolution, and education. I think that a misunderstanding of history begins with the Columbus myth and then just goes downhill from there. There's well, American Indians are the first Americans, yet when it comes to the public media, they're often the last Americans. Indians are part of that growth of a more diverse America that's suddenly saying we can't write the way we did newspapers in the 1950s. No other minority in the United States has ever signed a treaty with America. No other minority in the United States has self-government. No other minority has clearly defined borders and boundaries around their lands. So we are not just another minority. And the best way to understand that is is say, there is no Bureau of Black Affairs. There is no Bureau of Asian Affairs. But by God, there is a BIA. And that's yes, simple. I, I hope the, the schools of journalism uh, uh, do a better job. Uh, not, uh, they're doing a great job, technically um, speaking. But it's got to be some substance and some understanding and some sensitivity and some knowledge of history. Why is it that? We are a secret in the shadows of American society. In June 1992, American Indians and the media met to better understand each other. During a three-day conference at the University of Tulsa entitled The Media and the American Indian, 1492 to 1992 and beyond, Tribal leaders, Indian and non-Indian media professionals, students and the public confronted how the media portrays Indian people. This event was sponsored by the Tulsa and Oklahoma City region of the National Conference. In panel discussions, workshops, theater performance, film and video competition, participants worked together in a positive spirit to dispel myths and stereotypes about the Indian's place in American history and contemporary life. This gathering in Tulsa built on the success of the 1990 Media Conference in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, sponsored by the National Conference of the Minnesota and Dakotas region. Out of that meeting came a handbook for media professionals, a reference for reporting on American Indians. To share the ideas of the 1992 Tulsa Conference with a larger audience of professionals and students in the print and electronic media, Keynote speakers were videotaped responding to five questions about how the media does and doesn't cover Native Americans. The following excerpts feature Wilma Mankiller, Cherokee, Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, the second largest tribal group in the United States. Tim Gallego, Oglala Sioux, publisher and editor of Indian Country Today, formerly the Lakota Times, America's largest Indian-owned weekly newspaper. Susan Schoen Harjo, Cheyenne and Muskogee, Native Rights Activist and Director of the Morning Star Foundation. Gary Fife, Creek and Cherokee, host and executive producer of National Native News. The only nationwide Native American radio news program broadcast on more than 150 national public radio stations. Mark Trehant, Shoshone and Bannock, syndicated columnist, news editor for the Salt Lake Tribune, and award-winning investigative reporter. Kirk Kickingbird, Kiowa, law professor and director of the Native American Legal Resource Center. Jack Weatherford, professor of anthropology and best-selling author of Indian Givers and Native Roots. Paul Sand, executive regional director of the Minnesota and Dakotas region for the National Conference. The first question for our speakers, what about Native Americans is the most misunderstood by the media today? The 
there doesn't seem to be any fundamental understanding that all human beings have uh, forms of political and social organization, and so there obviously were before uh, the American Republic began to grow, there were governments here uh, on this continent, and that American history did not just begin uh, when uh, Columbus stumbled onto the continent. I think that is sort of the beginning of, of sort of misperceptions, and because there's such a lack of accurate information about Native people in the popular media or in academic institutions, people tend to fill that vacuum with um, negative stereotypes, silly stereotypes. American Indians have changed the world. They have changed the economy of the world. They have changed the languages of the world through the words that they have added to the languages. They've changed the food supply, the agriculture. They have changed the democratic government systems of the world. There's almost no area of life in the world today that has not been affected by the American Indians. I think the single most uh, thing misunderstood about American Indians by the media is the notion of it being just a race. Uh, it's also a political entity. Most Indians are tribes or governments that uh, make the same kinds of decisions as larger uh, governments or sometimes smaller governments. They also make uh, multi-million dollar economic decisions in their role as corporations because in addition to being a government, they're a corporation, which is probably unique to American government. The fact that it was because of Indian treaties that we were guaranteed certain rights. When we gave up millions of acres of lands, like in the Dakotas, and retained lands, we weren't taken away and put on, put on reservations like, say, a lot of the tribes in Oklahoma were. We retained lands that were already our ancestral lands. but. As a guarantee of the treaties, we were given certain rights, such as an education for our children, health care, uh, self-government, all of the things that non-Indians seem to think are welfare are actually rights that were guaranteed by treaty. And a good example would be on Native American um, uh, religions. Totally, there's, at least in Minnesota and Dakota's area, very, very little knowledge about the, from the non-Indian press in dealing with those religious issues that are coming up through sacred um, burial grounds, uh, sacred lands, rituals, things of that nature. And um, there seems to be um, a great deal of misunderstanding. The major media has been really very episodic or crisis oriented in its coverage. Or uh, as I like to say, the colorful remnant of America's past. And, hasn't really progressed significantly beyond that, that kind of thinking. It's like they're an exotic minority somewhere, and uh, let's go to the powwow. Let's get all the magnificent color and sound and music and movement, and it'll make our Indian coverage. But it doesn't get to the part where it really covers, uh, it goes from what I say, the beads and feathers to the bread and butter issues the kinds of things that all people are concerned with, like putting a roof over your head and feeding your kids and getting health care. These are issues that really do affect us here as contemporary Native peoples, and you don't find the coverage there because it isn't as exciting or, or heart-wrenching as an, an Indian as victim story. I mean, you get lots of drunk Indian kind of stories, and unfortunately, two major broadcast awards or two journalistic awards have been given out for that same story. And that's our feeling is, how long does this have to go on? The media today does not understand, really, that Native people are living and that we have a future. And that's something that's in the psyche of the world, that Native people are living somewhere in the last century, if we are alive at all, and if we are living differently, then we are somehow less than Indian. If we are doing the non-Indian things, if we are speaking English, if we are driving cars, then we are not Indian. We are supposed to be traditional, as if the traditions of last century are traditional to Native people of this hemisphere. The most misunderstood aspect of American Indian Affairs, I believe, is the status of the tribal government, the fact that they're independent sovereigns um, and that Furthermore, that they've been recognized as such uh, from the very beginning, through treaties, through statute, through court decisions, from 1789 down to the present day.
I think in part we've just overlooked the importance of American Indians in world history. Uh, the Indians were so uh, busy just trying to stay alive during the last 500 years that they certainly have not been able to make their case as loudly in the, in the World Forum as perhaps would have been desirable. But now at the end of the 20th century, the Native people have survived the worst of times and we see a real Native American renaissance going on. We see it with the new young writers who are coming along, with the new young artists, with the educational people in the Native community. We see it in the, in the tribal colleges, in the new museums that are rising up. American Indians are really taking a forefront position now, I think, in helping our society understand the problems around us. And in the 21st century, I think they're going to be major leaders. Well, everything you do in the media is done in a hurry. And uh, history heretofore has not been one of the uh, prerequisites. There's no such thing as a, a, a bar association for journalists. So there has no level that you have to come into to begin your profession. And as a result, you come in not knowing these things. The American school system has been uh, inadequate in teaching the notion of uh, where tribal governments fit into city, county, state models. And so these journalists reflect their society when they start their careers, and they have no clue about some of these other things. When they start encountering them, and it's usually in a, some sort of uh, jurisdictional confrontation, then all of a sudden they have to cover the issue without having the background to cover the issue. The history is written by the victors. And in our case, all of the history books were written by the non-Indians. And it was their interpretation of who they thought we were, their interpretations of what we were, that uh, non-Indian people have been reading about for generations. So in order, to, I think, to change and to re-educate America, you know, we, we, we can't just say we're going to educate America. We have to re-educate them. And that's really harder than educating them the first time around. Because a lot of uh, non-Indians have all these stereotypical misconceptions locked into their minds already. And uh, there's no one, by God, not an, especially an Indian, going to tell them that they're wrong. Because that's trying to make them politically correct. When in essence, all we're trying to do is make the things historically correct. When they come to Native American issues, it's usually at Thanksgiving and you get the old corn bean squash kind of thing and kids cutting out the paper headdresses. Well, guess what? The pilgrims didn't allow the natives to sit at the same table because they thought they were godless heathens. And, you know, that's, that's not right. But this image still hangs in people's mind that, oh, the great pilgrims invited the Indians to come share dinner. Well, if it hadn't been for those tribes, they wouldn't have had any dinner, and there wouldn't have been any pilgrims. And these are the kinds of things you never hear about in, in school. This misunderstanding persists because of the same old movie that's running through everyone's head. It's a confrontational movie. It is a costuming movie. Everyone has an idea that uh, Native people are the are all Cheyennes or all Sioux, that we all look like the prototype of the North American Plains Indian people when they think we exist at all. The United States is very quick to go around the world, to Panama or to the Persian Gulf, in order to enforce what we see as our treaty rights in other parts of the world. But somehow when it comes to treaty rights right here at home inside the United States, we've been extremely lax about that. So I'd like to see us start by first giving the Native Americans the rights that are guaranteed to them in the treaties that they have signed. So if we could start by following the treaties, I think that the whole country would be a lot better off. In a single word, treaty. Because if the media understood treaties that there are still valid agreements between the United States government and Indian tribes and would make such a clamor in radio, television, and the newspapers that our treaties are being violated day after day after day and make America stand up and, and live up to the guarantees in those treaties, everything else would follow. All of the things that we've been fighting for for 200 years would happen simply by honoring our treaties. Actually, I think the question is uh, a false premise. I, I don't think the media ought to focus on one thing in American Indians, and it's one of the things I've worked hard to change. Um, if you were to read the media accounts of American Indians over the past two years, probably the two most issues that gained the most ink would be the mascot issue and the uh, 
museum issues. Both of those issues are important, but there are also a lot of chronic issues dealing with live Indians that matter that aren't covered. Um, so I think you have to get the media to think about covering it as an ongoing developing story as they would any other ongoing developing story with all of the facets and all of the gray areas instead of limiting it to just what's interesting right now. I think that um, the, the reason this conference came, came about um, actually was about in 1985 when we started working on it in the uh, Dakotas area. Um, the United Sioux Tribe invited me out to appear for um, uh, federal hearings on civil rights violations. We had hearings in, in Sioux Falls, Pierre and Aberdeen. And I must say, um, I could close my eyes and think back, this could be Meridian, Mississippi in 1930. And some of the violations were so terrible, the prejudice and discrimination was absolutely appalling and not being addressed. And not by, uh, certainly not by the non-Indian uh, you know, media in that. So I think that that's number one. And, and without a clear understanding of what sovereignty means and what a tribal government can do, then people misunderstand it and they think that we're given a check from the government or that we have some super Indian, super citizen status. Well, if things were that rosy, we wouldn't be facing all the tragedies and hardships we already face and have to deal with. So it ain't necessarily so where we have more difficulty is with that constant bombardment of negative imaging from the media, from popular culture, from the automotive industry, the sports world, supermarkets and the like. And it's either that or being written out of existence altogether. Either we're absent or we're mischaracterized and miscast that there's another side to life in Native communities that doesn't ever get told. There's a story there that doesn't get told about um, the tenacity of Native people, the fact that despite everything that's happened to us over the last 500 years, we still have our ceremonies and culture. And even in the tribes as assimilated as, as acculturated as our tribe, there's still thousands of people who continue to speak Cherokee and still many, many people who are involved in tribal traditional arts and ceremonies and those kinds of things. So I think that's a story um, that needs to be told. But I think they're very important in one simple way, and that is they have been here for tens of thousands of years on this continent. They know this continent. They know its lands, rivers, plains. They understand it the way no one else does. Everyone else who lives here has only been here for a relatively short amount of time. And yet in that relatively short amount of time, some tremendous problems have occurred. Now the native people have a great knowledge that might help to overcome some of those problems because of their, their depth of time here. So I think for, if for no other reason, and there are others, but if for no other, it's the fact that they are the first Americans and they do know this land the best. The media, and this uh, I think I can divide it up even into television and newspapers, is in deep trouble. Uh, most American newspapers have had circulation that's been flat for about a quarter of a century. Most television stations are suddenly seeing the same thing happen in their markets. Uh, this thing we call the media is about to go through some huge changes, as is journalism schools. And I think we're part of that change rather than um, just starting to ride the wave. The reason why, I think, one of the reasons why newspapers need to change is they're writing for such a narrow market that the market has outgrown that. Uh, in Los Angeles, the second largest newspaper in, this, in the region now is La Opinion, uh, in the Spanish language. Uh, Indians are part of that growth of a more diverse America that's suddenly saying we can't write the way we did newspapers in the 1950s. One of the things we're trying to do at my newspaper, for example, to get away from that is to think about diversity issues in every story we cover. And second, um, because of all the other media and demands on our times, we're trying to focus on covering issues and trends rather than events. Um, newspapers in the 1950s, when it was just a few people deciding what was news, could run out and cover a press conference, and it would take care of everything. Uh, not all tribes have press conferences very often, so it doesn't take care of everything. But if you cover the issue, and if you look for the trend, um, it changes it, because then you have to go out and talk to. You have to find people to talk to. And that broadens the story and uh, makes it more interesting for everybody. 
there aren't many cultures in the world left that are distinct, that have important things to say that are different, have jurisprudential systems that are more sophisticated, that work better, that are more humane, have societal and social family values, if you will, that go more to the comfort and protection of the elderly and the youth, and have a worldview that has us as part of it rather than dominant over it, it being the world, the environment, we have keys and clues to the survival of this planet and everything on it and in it because we understand who we are in relation to it. And that is the sort of thing that the American media should inform people about. I think that they need to first study history. I think that uh, it's, it's almost impossible for a non-Indian media person who's uh, covering uh, Indian issues uh, to understand them without putting them in a historical context. And uh, I don't see how one could really even begin to understand the contemporary tribal issues without looking at all the historical factors that have played a part in our being where we are today. And then on the other side, looking at the kind of tenacity and spirit that Native people have that's allowed us to survive all that and still in 1992 say we want to maintain our culture and uh, a sense of self and who we are and uh, so that I, you know, I think that it's important to understand those things. I hope that the younger generation coming along will not have the blinders that my generation had. That when I went through school, I only learned about American Indians during Indian season, which was the time that started with Columbus Day in October and it ended with Thanksgiving Day in November. And most of what we did during Indian season was that we cut out some little feather headdresses that we put on. We made ships out of cardboard and paper and we pasted them up on the walls of the room. And that seemed to be about the end of our education about the coming together of European and American Indian civilization. But I think now, the young people now have a chance to overcome that. They have a chance to overcome the simple myths that we have learned in school in order to open it up so that the 21st century really does become a century of enlightenment for all of us. I would say enter the profession, um, I, and by that I'm talking mostly about American Indians and who might be thinking about it. Uh, the media has to change it, who it hires at all levels of who it hires. Um, you need senior editors who come from a tribal background. You need editorial board members and publishers from that kind of background, as you need copy editors and editors who are just uh, there. Um, one of the things I would like to see is when there's a story about prayer in schools, make, just see that there's also reflective of how Indians feel about those kind of issues. And to do that, you need the bodies who make the decisions. And uh, the next generation could make a difference there. I started the newspaper 12 years ago. Why is that newspaper now the largest weekly in South Dakota? a state that had weekly newspapers. In fact, it's got 155 news weekly newspapers. A state that uh, has these newspapers have been in existence for over 100 years. My paper started 12 years ago, and it's now the largest weekly in the state, bar none. Why is that? It's because I filled a very big void in the newspaper industry in South Dakota. I started to put together a newspaper that was, for the first time, serving the needs of the Indian people. These other papers that were near reservations, we call them border towns, had every opportunity for 100 years to do exactly what I did in 12 and didn't. So I'm firmly convinced that in order for us to change things in Oklahoma, South Dakota, Arizona, we have to do it ourselves. Nobody else is going to do it for us. We have to have our own newspapers. We have to have our own radio stations and eventually our own television station. That's the only way that we are going to change America's conception of us. Admit ignorance and use ignorance to your advantage because if that student reporter doesn't know, 
nine times out of ten, their listeners or viewers won't know either. So there are several opportunities to expand what they can do, probably do a lot of things that have not been done before, to scoop some people and, and, and understand that Native news is good news, period. So these are the kinds of things that they should do, and become involved in more current affairs and look how Native American people have been involved in all levels of society. Yes, we do have the social ills and, and the problems with people with alcohol, but we have people in all walks of life, doctors, lawyers, teachers, congressmen, journalists, and we lost people in Desert Storm too, and, and we're in the military and we have a long history of that. So these are some of the things we say, just for starters, try some of these ideas too and go beyond just that low, the poor Indian kind of thinking. Wherever the quest for the truth takes you, if the truth is the goal, then the truth may be the outcome and that that's the thread to follow rather than, as Deep Throat said in the Watergate era, follow the money. I think follow the truth. And if you follow the truth, it may not always be pleasant, but it will not be dull, and it may be rewarding because it's so seldom pursued and even more seldom achieved. There are obvious hurdles and obstacles, major ones that we have to overcome still, and I say we. So I'm not laying this all at the feet of major media saying it's all your fault. But they've got telephones too, just as the tribe do, and those lines go both ways. So the media does have to educate itself, and, and not to do that is damn near criminal or a disgrace for a place like Oklahoma and people still to be putting out headlines like Chief Holds Heap Big Pow Wow uh, just angers and frustrates so many people. And if they think about it, would they do that to their own people? No, they wouldn't. So we have to overcome this kind of thinking and say, hey, this has to change. And you have to educate and become more aware. On the tribal side, we have to say we have to be uh, more f outright forthcoming. We have not to be afraid of these people anymore. If we've got something good happening in our communities, by God, let's let them know. And maybe we can develop a more healthy relationship and a more understanding and progress. And in that direction, everyone wins. For more information on how to order copies of this program and discussion materials, contact the Tulsa office of the National Conference, 320 South Boston, Suite 1111, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74103, or call 918-583-1361, fax 918-583-1367. For more information on the Handbook for Journalists, the American Indian and the Media, contact the National Conference Office for the Minnesota Dakotas Region, 100 North 6th Street, Office 531B, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55403, or call 612-333-5365.